and thank you for watching DC Statehood Today, the show that keeps you informed on the latest DC Statehood news. I'm your host, Kwanasia McCoy. You can watch us online at dctv.org or dc51.us. You can also follow us on Twitter at DC51 Today. H.R. 1291, the bill that calls for the admission of the state of Washington, D.C. into the Union, has 146 co-sponsors in the House of Representatives. A Senate's equivalent, Bill S. 1278, introduced by Senator Thomas Carper, has 20 co-sponsors in the U.S. Senate. Both bills seek to make the District of Columbia the 51st state in the Union. Last year, Puerto Rico voted to become a state. As Puerto Rico launches its congressional delegation, known as the Puerto Rico Statehood Commission, Shadow Representatives Pedro Rosell and Alfonso Aguilar met recently with Washington, D.C. Shadow Senators Paul Strauss and Michael D. Brown and Shadow Representative Franklin Garcia to share experiences, accomplishments, and discuss Puerto Rico's and the district's lack of voting representation in the Congress. Puerto Rico now has five shadow members in the House of Representatives and two shadow senators. Both delegations continue to discuss how both territories can join the Union as states. The annual MLK Peace Walk and Parade took place on Monday, January 15th in Southeast D.C. Hundreds gathered on Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue to celebrate the life and activism of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. This is a time when D.C. statehood advocates promote statehood for Washington, D.C. It is well known that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. supported and marched for voting rights for the District of Columbia. The parade that takes place in the southeast part of the city is one of the oldest parades in honor of Dr. King going on for more than 35 years. President Donald Trump on November 2017 signed legislation to create a commission for the planning celebration of the 200th anniversary of the birth of Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass is the escaped slave who became a statesman and leader of the abolitionist movement. The law established a federal panel to carry out the upcoming festivities to honor Douglas, who was born in February 1818 in Maryland and lived most of his adult life in the Anacostia region of Southeast Washington, D.C. The bill was initially introduced in the House by D.C. Delegate Eleanor Holmes Norton and Maryland Representative Andy Harris, and in the Senate by Chris Van Hollen and Ben Cardin the two D Democratic Senators from Maryland. Events to honor Frederick Douglass will continue throughout the year in the city. Representative Franklin Garcia was recently featured in Street Sense Media. Street Sense Media is a citywide publication aimed at ending homelessness in the Washington, D.C. area by empowering people in need with the skills, tools, and confidence to succeed. In the featured article, Representative Garcia discussed the challenges presented by the pursuit of D.C. statehood, the impact statehood would have on the district residents, and his achievements on behalf of the district residents thus far. Representative Garcia also expressed his commitment to ensuring that district's homeless community is not forgotten. Street Sense Media was founded in 2003 and is now published bi-weekly. It was business as usual in the District of Columbia. During the recent government shutdown, Mayor Bowser assured district residents that the D.C. government would be open for business regardless of Congress's decision to shut down the federal government. Although the shutdown was brief, the district's government was sufficiently prepared to weather the storm. This is not the first time D.C. has remained open during the government shutdown. In 2013, then D.C. Mayor Vincent Gray also kept the D.C. government open during the 2013 government shutdown. Now stay tuned for our
for our interview segment and hear from several individuals making great strides in the D.C. statehood movement. Hello and welcome to the D.C. Statehood Today show. My name is Franklin Garcia and today we have with us the Attorney General for the District of Columbia, Carol Vizine. Carol Vizine was the first ever elected D.C. Attorney General. Welcome to the show. Thank you, uh, Congressman, for inviting me. Okay, well, wonderful. Um, tell us a little bit about your position um, and particularly how is it different now that it is an elected office? Excellent question. Uh, so I'm the Attorney General and as you noted, I uh, have, have the privilege of being the first elected Attorney General for the District of Columbia. My job as the Attorney General is to provide advice and legal guidance to the mayor, to the council, to all of the agencies of the District of Columbia. In addition, my job is to defend the district agencies if and when they're sued in court. What's really different now that you have an elected Attorney General is that the elected Attorney General, elected Attorney General now me, is directly accountable to the residents of the District of Columbia. It used to be that the Attorney General was appointed by the mayor, and so the Attorney General was accountable to the mayor. My boss, um, although I respect Mayor Bowser, is not Mayor Bowser. It's the residents of the District of Columbia. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you for all that information. Now, one of the things that we talk about in D.C. is that the, DC, uh, the District of Columbia court system, the entire judiciary system, is different than a state. How is it different, and are we really uh, not under our, the control of our judiciary system in the District of Columbia? Um, really complex question. The District of Columbia, as you well know, this is what you've been fighting for for a long time, remains a very peculiar jurisdiction. And we see that play out in regards to the criminal courts and the criminal jurisdiction of the Office of Attorney General. The Office of Attorney General is the exclusive prosecutor of juveniles in the District of Columbia. We have split jurisdiction over adult criminal offenses with the United States Attorney's Office. So the United States Attorney's Office brings most of the criminal charges against adults, not my office. As it turns out, the courts in the District of Columbia, the Superior Court, and the D.C. Court of Appeals, as part of the 1998 Revitalization Act, are in fact D.C. courts, but they are funded by the federal government. Wonderful. Thank you for all that explanation. And how about this idea that if somebody uh, ends up in the, I guess, in, in incarcerated in the District of Columbia, that they can actually be serving their term somewhere in Texas, how is, that, uh, how is that true? So there are so many, uh, I would say, injustices as a result of our peculiar jurisdiction. And one of the injustices is that which you just described. Namely, we have a D.C. jail. The D.C. jail houses folks who are charged with offenses and does have space for people who are convicted of misdemeanor offenses. For individuals who are convicted of felony offenses and they're sentenced to jail, they're actually tendered over to the Federal Bureau of Prisons. And so it's a real problem that we have so many of our residents who are incarcerated outside of the District of Columbia in prisons that are run by the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Let me tell you why it's a big problem. All of the data demonstrates that prisoners do better when they come back into the community if they're engaged and involved with their family members uh, and other support networks in their community. Well, it's very difficult to have that level of support and familiarity if a D.C. resident is, say, locked up in Oklahoma. So the whole reintegration into the community, back into the District of Columbia, for D.C. residents who have been locked up outside of the District of Columbia is far more difficult than it needs to be. Got it. Now let's shift a little bit in the immigration area. Um, how is D.C. Uh, different in that it's labeled, or I guess uh, denominated as a sanctuary city? How is it different than states? And do we have the leverage, for example, 
I know that uh, the Trump administration and the uh, Attorney General for the U.S. is after sanctuary cities, uh, including claims that they're going to limit funding for certain programs. How is D.C. different, and what can we do should something like that really happen in the District of Columbia? Well, let me first talk about what a sanctuary city in the District of Columbia really means. What a sanctuary city in the District of Columbia means is that the D.C. government will not inquire about someone's immigration status for the provision of any service or any good that you know, they might interact with with the uh, D.C. government. So we do not ask people whether they are a green card holder, um, a U.S. citizen, a tourist visa, or anything of that sort. That's number one. Number two, what it also means is that while we are compliant with the federal government if we're holding someone in a D.C. jail that they have a subpoena for, we will comply with the subpoena. We will not, however, hold people in a D.C. jail longer than their prison term in order to make sure that the federal government has a chance to get them. No, what we do instead is we hold people in jail for exactly the time period that they're supposed to be, and after that, they're free to go. Now talk a little bit about your collaboration with other, other attorney generals. I know that there is an effort to sue on behalf of some of the efforts of, uh, from this administration. How is that going in courts? Sure. So um, you know, as Attorney General of the District of Columbia, I'm part of uh, a couple of organizations. The National Association of Attorney Generals, it's a bipartisan organization. And as a Democrat, I'm a part of the Democratic Attorney General's Association. I have to say that I'm proud that my colleagues have voted me to be the co-chair of the Democratic Attorney General's Association. That organization has really mobilized itself in a collaborative and cooperative way to fight against some of what we see as legal excesses that the Trump administration is pursuing. For example, we are actively litigating against the Department of Justice and Attorney General Sessions on their view of sanctuary cities. We think sanctuary cities should be legal and, then, and the federal government should not threaten them with taking away funds. So we're in court on those matters. My colleagues and I are also in court on other matters including immigration cases like the travel ban cases and also lastly my colleague in Maryland Brian Frosch and I have sued President Trump under uh, a clause in the Constitution called the Emoluments Clause. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that explanation. Now let's shift over to statehood. Uh, and here's a technical question that I have, and that is uh, the strategy we currently have is really to reduce the size of the national capital, Washington, D.C., and make the residential part of our city the 51st state. Yes. Now we know that the Constitution was amended so that Washingtonians can participate in the electoral process. That's right. Now what happens with the 23rd Amendment once Washington, D.C. becomes a state and the size of the national capital is reduced? So that's a great question. And as you said, the 23rd Amendment was very important because what it did is it gave Washington, D.C. residents three electoral college votes for the presidency of the United States. My office reviewed uh, the Tennessee model, which is the model that the District of Columbia is currently pursuing in regards to getting statehood. And we concluded that the Tennessee model um, does not have an impact on the 23rd Amendment. In other words, that we could pursue the Tennessee model and become a state. Now, I do think there's some cleanup work to be done after we become a state, because as you said, the federal district will be so small that, of course, it wouldn't be worthy of having three electoral votes. I think that cleanup of the 23rd Amendment uh, could, could take place after we became a state. Wonderful. And the last question I have is, uh, believe it or not, I think that we, are, we have a momentum for this statehood at the moment. What are the things that you think, how do we broaden 
the coalition? How do we get more attention? Make DC statehood a movement, a national movement. What are some of the ideas that you think we can possibly uh, inject into this movement? Well, I think that uh, you and others have been at this for many, many, many years. And so I do agree with you that the momentum is coming our way. After all, it's only fair that we have taxation and representation. What I would offer as a suggestion, and I know that you and others are doing this, is to really engage the young people in the District of Columbia, including uh, the many, many, many new arrivals, to understand what the older folks in D.C. who've lived here all their lives know, that this idea of operating in a regime where we don't have a voting member in Congress, where we don't have senators, where we have a Congress that can overwrite D.C. laws passed by the D.C. City Council must come to an end. And I really think that if we are able to galvanize the younger people to join us veterans in the fight, that we'll have even more momentum for eventual statehood in the District of Columbia. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Franklin. Thank you. My guest today has been Attorney General for the District of Columbia, Carl Vicin. My name is Franklin. Thank you for watching us. Washington, D.C. is home to nearly 700,000 U.S. citizens. They live in 131 neighborhoods that make up our nation's capital. But did you know that the residents of your nation's capital have no voting representation in U.S. Congress? Yeah, no. That's why we stand for odds and dayhood. I'm Frankie Bars, got the keys to statehood. We amend the Constitution for equal rights from 16th and Penn. Now clean this dirty mess and watch and tone it. Didn't have the right while we never voted. Year 1801, Congress stole it. You may live on the land, but you'll never own it. That's why the residents of Washington, D.C. need your help so they too can have equal rights. Call your member of Congress and tell them to support D.C. statehood in Congress. Welcome back to the D.C. Statehood Today show. My name is Franklin Garcia, and today we have with us in our studio the former executive director for the local chapter of the ACLU, Johnny Barnes. Uh, Mr. Barnes is also known as the attorney of the people. Welcome to the show, Mr. Barnes. Glad to be here. Now, I know it's difficult to find anybody who doesn't know in Washington, D.C., who Johnny Barnes is, but for the benefit of our audience, can you give us a little background of who you are and what you do? Well, um, I worked on the Hill for a quarter of a century of my life, and, uh, and so statehood is very important to me. We introduced the, modern, the first modern statehood bill, H.R. 51, some years ago, and it's progressed since then. And uh, was, as you say, with the ACLU, and I uh, practice law from time to time. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, now let's talk a little bit about your latest action item. I know that you are involved in the Take a Knee uh, action item that, uh, you know, I've seen you do it all over. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what uh, prompted you to uh, join that movement? Well, the, the president, I think, um, try to take us to a very dangerous place, uh, just like King George did years ago, and that's why a revolution was fought. And that was to suppress the right of the people to say what they want to say, to write what they feel, to practice the faith they believe in, or none, and to peaceably assemble and petition the government. That's what the First Amendment, and it's first because it's so important. All the other amendments and all our other rights spring from that First Amendment right, and Donald Trump has been trying to step on that right, just like King George did. Now, you are also uh, a little involved with the DACA issue, and I know mm -hmm. that the ACLU recently sued yes. uh, the administration for their unlawful uh, termination of the program. What is your thought of, of, of that, and how do, how do you see D.C.'s situation specifically uh, because we're not a state? Well, I think because we're not a state, we don't have uh, the power that states have. With, with statehood, statehood comes power and resources. But I think that uh, our government has been courageous in making us a sanctuary city. Uh, our government has been courageous in speaking out against uh, 
the, those people who would uh, discriminate against immigrants of color. You know, the thing about the older immigrants, uh, they could get lost in the crowd, but black people, brown people, yellow people can't get lost in the crowd. And so that, that thing that they say uh, that these folks are trying to make America white again is true. There are some white Americans who fear uh, the coloration of America. And so I think that's why they've been so, uh, the Trump administration in particular has been so hard on immigrants of color. Now let's uh, shift over to DC statehood. Mm -hmm. um, how do you see currently uh, the progress, what progress have we made in terms of statehood right now in comparison to the days when you actually started, started much of the movement? I think the work that you have done, Franklin, and the others in the statehood movement, and people don't realize how close we are to statehood. There was a bombshell of a, uh, of a news report today about uh, 13 Russians being indicted. Uh, so two, one of two things, or maybe both, will happen, which will thrust statehood into the limelight very shortly. Either uh, the Democrats are going to go up and we're going to retake the House and retake the Senate, and if that happens, we're going to ram statehood through the Congress. I don't know if, if whoever's president then will sign it. The, other, the second thing is that Trump's in serious trouble. And so I think statehood, uh, the, the stars have aligned. We're closer today than we ever have been. We have more co-sponsors in the House. We, we uh, will likely, as I said, retake the House in Senate because of what's going on in the current administration. And so we're so close, and that's because of what you do and have done and what the others in the state of the movement have done. Well, thank you so much for that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so tell me, how do we make DC statehood a movement? I know that we talked about in the past that being uh, perhaps there was a moment for yeah. statehood, but how do we turn that moment? Because I think in spite of uh, this administration and this Congress not being be very supportive to statehood, I think we do have uh, kind of like a momentum going on right now. Yes, absolutely. And so how do we turn that into a movement, a national movement for statehood? How do you think we can make that happen? Well, I think it's going to happen. There are 145 co-sponsors in the House now. I think when, when the Democrats retake the House, that bill is going to be on the floor. Uh, we almost did it back when Jim Wright was the Speaker of the House and the Democrats had the House and Senate and then Newt Gingrich got him on his book deal. But we were going to ram it through the Congress. I think that's going to happen in the next Congress. And that will make it a national movement. People will pay attention. Because even conservatives are not, it can't be against giving people fundamental rights. It's really a conservative issue. It's really an issue for the Tea Party and those kind of folks. It's local control of local issues. Uh, so I think, I think we're, in, we're in good shape. And it will be national as soon as that happens. Now let me ask you a technical question mm -hmm. here. Now our approach for statehood is that we are going to reduce the size of the national capital. Yes. And then the residential parts will make the 51st state. Yes. Now what happens with the 23rd Amendment once that happens? Because now the, the idea is that nobody is going to be living in the national capital, the reduced size of our current city. Mm -hmm. And they're then going to be the ones with, the, uh, with that amendment would apply to them. Yeah. What do we do in that situation? It becomes a dead letter. We don't have to do anything. It'll still be in the Constitution, but it won't be operative. There is, there's still provision in the Constitution that slave masters can cross state lines to retrieve their states. That's still in the Constitution. So it doesn't operate at all. I don't think we have to worry about that. We had many hearings when I was with the Congress and every constitutional scholar said the same thing. Peter Raven Hanson at George Washington, uh, professors from Virginia, University of Virginia Law School. It's a dead letter. We don't have to worry about it. We don't have to worry about Trump voting uh, from the White House in, uh, for D.C. State. Okay, and the last question is just tell us about some of the projects that you're working on right now. Well, I'm doing a lot of uh, work with, in foreclosure court, um, defending, trying to help people keep their homes. There are 3,000 foreclosures that were filed last year in uh, D.C. Superior Court. Not one case has gone to trial. I'm taking a case now to the Supreme Court because I think it's discriminatory that the judges won't allow these foreclosure cases to go to trial. They, they issue summary judgments. So I, I've always believed that housing, if you have a roof over your head, and your health, you can make it. Housing is critical to making it. 
And so um, I've always been offended by evictions. And so I'm fighting to keep the people in their homes in foreclosure court. I'm doing a lot of that work. It's been my pleasure, Franklin. Thanks. Wonderful. Uh, th my name is Franklin, and this has been the segment of This is Day Today Show. My guest has been attorney Johnny Barnes. Thank you very much. Hello and welcome back to the DC Statehood Today Show. My name is Franklin Garcia. And today we have with us in the studio Kevin Chavis. Kevin Chavis is the uh, president of the DC Young Democrats. Welcome to the show, Kevin. Thank you very much, Franklin. Good to be here. Uh, wonderful to have you here. Now tell us a little bit about yourself, Kevin. Uh, well, I'm a native Washingtonian, uh, born and raised in DC. Um, and I've been active really in politics for a long time. Uh, uh, my father was on the city council, so I grew up sort of in this stuff. And um, I went to high school in D.C., actually went to college in D.C. as well, went to Howard University for undergrad and law school. Um, and since graduating, um, I've started my own practice where I work primarily um, in real estate, so some landlord-tenant, um, and also some personal injury um, and probate stuff as well. Um, and I'm now the chair of the Young Democrats. I've been the chair since 2015 um, and we've done a lot of good work in the city uh, and I think it's a great organization. Now a lot of accomplishments there. <coughs> now I know you run for public office at one time. Yes. Any uh, future plans to run again? Well I don't rule it out. You know, I, I'm focused on the work I'm doing with the Young Democrats and also um, I'm a member of the board of Marshall Heights uh, Civic Association that we just restarted um, a couple years ago. Uh, and I'm also on the board of the United Planning Organization, UPO. I just started that. So uh, I don't rule it out, but um, so nothing immediate, but uh, we'll see. I still think it's in the cards for me at some point. Well, let's talk about uh, the DC Young Democrats. Uh, tell okay. us a little bit about the organization, what they're about, about how many sure. members do we have. I know that uh, one of the things that we try to do in the city is get more young people involved in the political process. Yeah, absolutely. So tell, tell us about how the Young Democrats are doing that, but first tell us about the organization itself. Okay, sure. Uh, well, the D.C. Young Democrats are the local chapter of the Young Democrats of America, uh, YDA, which is the youth arm, so to speak, of the Democratic National Committee, DNC. So they've got chapters in 49 of the 50 states including DC. Uh, so we work with YDA to come up with the national platform that is usually closely aligned with the DNC's platform, but that pays closer attention to issues affecting youth. So we work with them, we work with YDA and the other chapters. We have you know three meetings a year where we get together to talk about issues. But locally, we uh, are very active uh, with the primaries that, that um, are held every two years. So this year we'll have a, a town hall. We'll send a questionnaire out to candidates running for offices. Um, and we try to hold consistent events in order to recruit people to join the party because we don't want um, people to get apathetic. As Democrats, we need to be fired up. We need to be energetic and we need to continue to recruit new people. So we try to come up with interesting ways, interesting event concepts to get young people involved. So the organization's open to people aged 18 to 36. Um, so if you're old enough to register to vote, you're old enough to, to be a young Democrat. Um, and it doesn't mean we turn people away that are younger than 18 or older than 36, but um, those are our official, that's the official age range. It seems, uh, <laughs> just a side note here, it just seems that they keep raising that min that age limit there. It used to be 35 right. and now it's 36 <laughs> right. at some it point. It makes sense. <laughs> Probably should be 40. I mean, 40 is the new 30. You know, people are living longer. Some people say we should raise it up and make it even accessible for people that are younger, like 14 or 15. Some high schoolers want to join. So I think that is something we need to look at. <laughs> Very you know. good. Everybody's going to be young. Young is a state of mind. You know, you so. That's right. So tell us then, um, 
one of the things we try to do in the statehood movement is get more young people involved. Mm -hmm. uh, is, are the young Democrats doing anything to get young people involved in the statehood movement in the District of Columbia? Well, we, we have had, um, at our meetings, we've discussed ways to do that. One of the things we have done um, is we, for the last two biannual conventions with the Young Democrats of America, we have gotten them to approve a resolution supporting statehood. So we've gotten YDA to include that in their official platform, um, which we think is, is positive. Uh, we actually had um, very, um, and I wish I brought it with me, but a shirt that promoted statehood that we wore during the, um, during the convention. So we brought attention to it that way. But it is important for us to make sure people are educated about the issue locally and that we make sure that people understand how important it is for us to get the rights that, that states have, full voting rights, full autonomy. Um, and one thing that I did, Asi, the uh, Office of the Superintendent, has a career summit that they do, and I went, um, this was last year, I went and did a sort of like a seminar kind of thing to talk about statehood, what, what it means, what the movement's about to some kids that were in middle school, you know, sixth grade, seventh grade. And I think that doing things like that may be useful to educate youth in DC, even younger than maybe young Dems age, but um, even high school age, you know, middle school age, so that they understand what it means. Because I think it can be confusing, um, you know, if you're not in the, in the books the way you and I may be on this issue. And I think it would be helpful if we you know, maybe incorporate into the curriculum. They have to take a DC history class or DC statehood 101, something like that. That's a very good idea because one of the things that we always talk about is making DC statehood rele relevant. Mm -hmm. And so how do you see us making DC statehood relevant to young people so that they can actually have a stake in this fight? Right, um, I, th I think it starts by First, getting them in the door, we've got to make sure the meetings that, like the Democratic State Committee, the DC Young Democrats, uh, make sure those meetings are attractive to young people because I, it always, um, you know, I, I know we had like the statehood convention, the New Columbia uh, Constitutional Convention meetings, um, and I don't think there are enough young people in the room. There were a lot of young people who were, who were um, passionate, but I think we could do a better job of that and I think um, by coming to them, meeting them where they are, maybe we need um, a local celebrity to come out and support and do a commercial or a PSA or something, maybe an athlete or a musician, something like that may be helpful. Uh, but I do think that with social media and with um, advances in technology, more people are starting to get involved and I think we are closer than we've been in a long time. You know, to getting statehood. Now, the city's leadership renewed a plan called the Tennessee Plan, basically injected some energy to mm -hmm. statehood. Um, did you, what is, what, what is your perception in terms of how we're moving forward with statehood? Are we, <coughs> uh, I know you are a native Washingtonian and you've been around and you've seen this movement over the years. Uh, do you see, is your perception that th this movement is moving forward currently the way it is right now with the renewed Tennessee plan that's in place? Uh, I think it is. I think that um, it, I think that people around the city, our leaders, are definitely moving in the same direction. So I think it's good that we're on the same page. Um, but I do think that uh, personally, the, the idea of statehood, I think because we say, when we say we want to be a state, I think that it makes people that aren't from D.C. instantly, um, some people, instantly kind of push back and they say, well, the Constitution says you, you're not a state. I think that by, I think people get caught up on the name it, by saying, oh, well, D.C. wants to be a state, but they're, the Constitution says they can't be a state. And I think, I know back in, um, I guess it was the late 70s when we actually tried to get a constitutional amendment that would allow DC voting rights and autonomy, but we wouldn't be a state, but it would be as if we were a state. And it seemed like that was actually close to being adopted. I think 16, 
states signed on to support. So I, you know, I know a lot of people, including myself, think we should be a state, but it may be more effective to focus on the voting rights aspect, the full autonomy aspect, um, and, and, and it may be easier for us to get people who aren't from D.C. on board if they don't get distracted by the state um, issue. Because like when I went to YDA, the convention, people would say things like, oh, well, we have 50 stars on the flag. So if, if we add a new state, now it's 51. Well, that's not that important, but that's how they think. You know, I think that's a terrible reason to not give us statehood, but that's how people are thinking. They act like we have 50 states the whole time. We just got to 50, you know, in the 1950s. But um, I, I think we can be creative about how we package it so that people don't just instantly say, oh, well, that doesn't make sense and just like not take it seriously because it, it is serious. We pay more taxes than, than I think four states or something. I think, I think you were the one telling me that, that we pay more taxes than several states. We've got more people than at least two states. I mean, it doesn't make sense that um, we don't have representation. It just, at this point, it's, it's gotten, it's just, it makes no sense. And um, I think as we get the word out, we are closer than ever, but we can be creative about the way we, I think, message it too. Wonderful. Well, that's a great <coughs> line to end it in. Uh, thank you so much for being in the show thank today, you. Kevin. All right. Wonderful. Thanks for having me. Uh, this has been the segment of the DC Statehood Today show. My guest has been Kevin Chavis, the Young Democrats President. Thank you for watching. Thank you for watching us. Remember, you can watch us online at dctv.org or dc51.us. You can also follow us on Twitter at dc51today. I'm your host, Kwanasia McCoy, and we hope to see you next time on DC Statehood Today.